Hello, everyone, and welcome to the December 2023 edition of the CNS Journal Club podcast. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Trailer, and I'm a resident at UT Southwestern Medical Center, and I'll be the moderator for today's discussion. Today, we'll be talking about two articles, both under the title International Tuberculum Cell Meningioma Study, which is a little different than how we normally do it. Um, and we'll get into the details of that in just a moment. Uh, but first, I'm going to start by introducing our guest faculty and uh, uh, the author here today. So, um, Dr. McGill, would you mind introducing yourself for us? Yeah, hello, I'm Stephen McGill. I'm a neurosurgeon now at Northwestern University. Uh, take care of skull patients with brain tumors and especially skull-based tumors. And this study was the brainchild of Michael McDermott. And we started it when I was at UCSF as a resident there before I became faculty and ultimately finished. So it, it was really between the two of us and it's great to be here today. Thank you so much. And uh, Dr. Linda B is joining us from uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital. Would you mind introducing yourself for us? Hi, Jeff. Thanks so much for putting this together. It's uh, truly an honor to join Stephen in this incredible mammoth work. Um, I'm, as you mentioned, I'm a tumor skull based surgeon at Brigham and uh, delighted to be part of this. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, um, why don't we start off with a summary of the two projects, uh, Dr. McGill, and then we can sort of talk about some of the questions each of us have and maybe uh, some of the debate that's around this particular subject. Yeah, so the two studies both have the same name because it was a, a large study. There were over 130 authors from 40 sites that contributed cases to this. So we called it the International Tuberculum Cell and Meningioma Study. We had groups from all over the world. Um, as well as across the US and Canada. The real question of the study was, uh, what is the best management for tuberculum cell meningiomas? And there have been a, a source of debate with very strong opinions on either side that you know they should always be resected from a transcranial approach or always an endoscopic approach. And any time you have disagreement, I think that's an opportunity to learn something about that. And so that was really the impetus to start the study. We had looked at in the past at the outcomes from UCSF where I had trained uh, of Michael McDermott and the other surgeons there. And then we compare it along with the group from Italy, from Naples, Italy, Paolo Capobianca and Aristodidivitis. Um, and we published in 2018 our group's outcome between the two groups. And we had developed a grading scale to try to guide, you know, how do you know when to go from above or when to go from below? And we, this grading scale took into consideration the diameter of the tumor. Um, it took into consideration the invasion into the optic canal and the relationship of the tumor with the arterial and neurovasculature around the tuberculum cella. That when we, we had a hundred, I think it was 111 patients or something in that study, which we thought was awesome for a tuberculum cell meningioma study, given the rarity of the tumor. But when you actually break it up and you try to compare apples to apples, you couldn't, we didn't have enough patients to do that. Each, every surgeon is doing the best surgery they can for their patient, whether it's going endonasal or whether it's coming from above. And so we realized in order to compare the outcomes, we needed a lot greater um, sorry about that. In order to compare the outcomes, we needed a much greater uh, number of patients. And so we, be, Dr. McDermott and I began sending out emails to all sorts of people across the country, anybody essentially who was a skull-based surgeon that we had their email of and knew and said, hey, do you want to contribute cases? And over several years, people started sending us their data and putting that together, we came up with the this International Tuberculum Cell Meningioma Study. And I divided it into two papers because one, I just wanted to report what were the outcomes, what was the study demographics and data. And that's the first uh, paper, which we can talk a little bit more about looking at how, how has the management of these tumors changed over time and complications that people encounter. And then the second study is really looking at this grading scale. And I used the grading scale as well as clinical features to propensity match patients. Because there's such a bias in whether you come endonasal or transcranial, patients would, if you came to a site that was a transcranial site, uh, that was all you got. And if you went to a site that was endonasal, that was pretty much all you got. And that created an opportunity, regardless where we could match tumor uh, patients based by their tumor characteristics, its size, 
the grading scale, its arterial and optic canal involvement, and then truly try to compare apples to apples. And I think that's what really gave this study strength to try to answer when should you go endonasal, when should you go transcranial, and what are the likely outcomes to, for an individual patient? Is that this first figure here, Dr. McGill? I just wanted to... Yeah, in the, that... in the the study, International Tuberculum Cell and Meningioma Preoperative Grading Scale to Predict Outcomes and Propensity Matched Outcomes, in, I call that our second paper. Um, in that paper, the first figure, we plotted out the number of, at, for each institution, how many surgeries, how many tuberculum cell meningiomas did they take out through the nose and how many did they take out transcranially? No center had experience with 20 surgeries in either approach. And that's even combining across surgeons. So there was no institution you, a patient could go to out of these 40 renowned institutions. And they say, well, at our institution, we've done at least 20 through the nose and at least 20 transcranial, which is wild, but just reflects the rarity of the tumors. The most striking feature, there were only, I think, four institutions, if I recall correctly, that in looking at this, that had done 10 of each. And 10 endonasal, and this is over like a 15, 20 year period. So what you really notice is if you look at either access, the institutions tend to hug there. Some institutions only did endonasal, 51 cases, tuberculum cell, incredible experience, Ted Schwartz and the, the group at, at Cornell. Or, you know, if you, many plus sites were almost all transcranial, or maybe they did one or two endonasal. Um, 30, 40, plenty of sites like that. At UCSF, we had almost 80, I think it was 75, 78 tumors that we had done um, transcranially. But so that really created this. And when you looked at that, and I think if you look at the data on the average tumor maximum diameter, um, they, were, they were technically, there was a difference where there was a bias towards smaller tumors being done endonasal, but the range was up to five centimeters endonasal resected and up to and down to 0 0.3 millimeters three millimeters resected transcranially. So the, there was a huge overlap in the ranges, which we could then compare master surgeons endonasal with master surgeons transcranial and say what what is what is actually the better outcome in a similarly matched patient. Wonderful. So you, obviously the impetus for this study was the equipoise between a transcranial or an endonasal approach. So what is the, uh, the debate, I guess, have you explained that first uh, between the two approaches? Why do some surgeons prefer endonasal over uh, transcranial, for example? I think every surgeon, and, and I have to thank all the authors for, for contributing and being vulnerable to sharing their data, but every surgeon, myself included, is going to do what they can do best for that patient. And if you have a skill set that is biased towards an endonasal approach and you're pretty slick at it and you have really good outcomes, you want to do everything, even these massive tumors endonasally. If you're a transcranial surgeon who does a, a pituitary every once in a while and maybe a craniopharyngioma through the nose if it's down low, you don't want to be dissecting off the optic nerve. The other thing is what you can do is also institutional and equipment dependent. If you're trying to use bayoneted instruments with an endoscope through the nose, your degrees of freedom are not nearly the same as if you have single shafted instruments. If you're fellowship trained in endonasal, if you're doing three pituitaries a week and then every couple of weeks you're doing a tuberculum cell or a craniopharyngioma and you're going through the nose. So each surgeon, part of why this is that way is just some of your training, your biases, what you know you can get that patient through safely. And that's what we saw, you know, 87% of the patients in the study, regardless of approach, had either better or stable vision postoperatively. That's incredible outcomes for tumors that can, that all compress or adhere to the optic nerve, you know, they're in, wrapped around cerebrovasculature, like people are doing the right thing for the patient. So, and that's why we could do the study because we didn't know what would be better or worse. Um, you ask what, what factors kind of predict that? I think there's, has, over the years, a consensus has developed from the endoscopic community, you know, Paul Gardner, Ted Schwartz, Danny Prevedello, the, a lot of the bigger names in endoscopic that what they've found in Ted, or Paul Gardner has a very nice paper within the last couple of years showing like, where did you fail endoscopically with anterior cranial basement and geomas? And where he had residual tumors and issues was when the tumor went lateral to the optic nerve, because you can't go through it. Um, and when the tumor was calcified, uh, but those were kind of the two major things. 
or when it was calcified and wrapped around vessels, then you would have residuals. And so I think those patients, he or he has shown very nicely, those are kind of some of the limits of the endoscopic approach. Um, with a transcranial approach, uh, you get into trouble, you can get into a lot more trouble when there's either extended to the nose, which is pretty rare for tuberculum cellum and angiomas. Um, but you should be able to access most regions transcranially. I see. Thank you. And uh, I want to loop in Dr. B here because I know that she has uh, her own, obviously, expertise and approach to these type of tumors. What are your thoughts on that uh, generally, Dr. B? I fully applaud Stephen for his, uh, his, with his answer and his concept on this, that every surgeon tries to do the best that they can and offer the safest care for the patient. Um, for me, classically, I would prefer a, or rather um, choose a, a transcranial approach, specifically something with an anterior clinodectomy. So whether that's superorbital, cranial orbital, or, or any variations of, but I think it's the wide exploration and decompression of bilateral optic nerves and optic canals that um, uh, is critical in, in these tumors. So I think Stephen's work has lent a lot of insights, not only into the operative decision-making, the results, but also the biology of these types of cases. Absolutely. I, I just um, add one comment, Jeff, it, it, highlighting what Linda said. Early, the reason that endoscopic surgeons pushed really hard and what we actually found, and we'll talk about in a minute, the results, is that if you come endoscopically, you decompress the optic nerves first. And I think doing that, like Linda's talking about when you come from above, uh, decompressing that optic nerve first, doing the clinoidectomy, decompressing the optic canal, then the nerve is not tethered and compressed with a seat belt of the falciform ligament with the bone of the optic canal and the tumor squishing it at the edge. So once you, you wanna release that compression as early as possible. And I think that's why many people, when they went endonasal, they thought, hey, I did a lot better job. Because if you're doing a, a tuberculum cell meningioma transcranially and you don't open the optic canal, then all every time you manipulate that tumor or push it, you're pushing a compressed optic nerve against a sharp seat belt, that dural fold, the end of the optic canal, something like that. And so I think then you can start to get into trouble and you have a few vision losses and you say, hey, this is no good. Let's try it somewhere else. But really compliment Dr. B on, um, you know, highlighting the important point of decompressing the optic nerve early, and even think, if coming from transcranial approach. <laughs> and I think what you mentioned is, you know, when folks think extended into nasal, they have a particular vision of what that means um, because of the corridor and the, the uh, access to either one or both kind of optic canals and, and such. But when folks say transcranial, uh, especially as highlighted in, in your elegant figure, there's probably 10 different actual approaches being done. And those actual approaches, even as, as they're named, whether you call it cranial orbital or orbital zygomatic or terional or you know, subfrontal, that's just the surface craniotomy. But, but really, when you get to the tuberculum and to the um, falciform ligament and the clinoid, that's actually where the tumor and the work happens. And so I think a better understanding of what's going on, uh, where the action is, is probably, a, um, you know, even a more salient comparison than just the, the categorical uh, umbrella of transcranial. Yeah. And, you know, that's interesting. That's something we had handles on what approach every author contributed that. So whether it was a cranial orbital, just a terional, a bifrontal, extended bifrontal, some people preferred for these, especially more historically. Um, what we did not collect was the optic canal compressed, decompressed extradurally, was a clinoidectomy done. And I don't have that information in this study. And I would be fascinating, actually, if, you, if we went back in, in the transcranial cases and said, we're the ones that had vision decline, ones that we did not do that early decompression to get a better handle on that. Or any decompression. Or any decompression. Because yeah. you just do a terional, go subfrontal, you can get to the tuberculum like we do for every okay. aneurysm that we used to clip in the back in the day. <laughs> and unless you look for it, you know, by opening the, the optic canal or looking underneath that clinoid, you may not see the tiny little tongue, which of course will get to your um, point of the recurrence, which I'm sure we'll discuss soon. So I wanna go back quickly before we, I'll have Dr. B ask some questions as well, but getting back to some of the factors that point you in one direction or the other, this may not be possible to answer, but is there a, 
is there a tumor that you could imagine what factors would predict or would give you sort of equipoise, Dr. McGill, between transcranial or endonasal? Like what is, is it one that has more lateral extension or, um, you know, one that has a lot of invasion into the orbital, into the orbit? Um, what factors would give you pause on choosing one approach over another? Well, any tumor that extends lateral to the optic nerve significantly, I think is very difficult to safely resect endonasally. So that's kind of in my mind, and the whole principle of skull-based surgery is to try not to work across cranial nerves, because we all know what happens with petroclavulman and geomas, where you have to work across cranial nerves, you know, you get it, that's where people get complications and you get into trouble because it's really difficult. Um, so if the tumor goes lateral to the optic nerves, generally a transcranial approach is what I would recommend and certainly do in my practice. Um, where there's equipose is probably anything in between. So if it's not lateral to the optic nerves, not overly calcified, um, not wrapped around vessels, although that's not a complete contraindication to an endonasal approach by any means um, for surgeons who are skilled in, in dissecting it free from there. Um, but any of those could be done either way. You know, if, if it's small, if it's between, you know, if it's even if the optic nerves are just pushed laterally and it's wide, you can take out some big wide tumors endonasally. So any of those really are a surgeon's choice, in my opinion. Right. Um, I did want to highlight sort of the main finding here from the first paper before we get into some more questions. And I wanted to sort of ask your thoughts on that. You said that uh, and a nasal approach may for selected tumors may have better visual outcomes. It seems like you've already answered that, that it's early decompression of the optic canal. Are there any other factors that you think might be contributing to that finding? Um, yeah, so I think, so the big finding, especially that we found that was held up with propensity matching is that in patients who have a preoperative visual deficit, uh, we did see a better uh, a pr outcome, more, more vision improving versus those that stay the same if you went endonasal. Um, I think that probably is related to the early optic nerve decompression, um, but I don't really know. Interestingly, the number that gets worse, which is about you know, 10% or 12, 11%, something like that. Or I guess in ones with a preoperative visual deficit, um, the rate of visual worsening is 8%, endonasal versus transcranial. So when you, at least, you know, when we looked at the matched uh, tumors, so no difference in getting worse, but you're more likely to have improvement. And I think that that may be why um, is really that early decompression of the optic nerve. And that, that's what I was taught and what makes sense as you, as my experience is growing and doing these actually myself. Wonderful. I wanted to, before we move on to the next paper, I wanted to ask Dr. B, do you have any specific questions about the, uh, about the outcomes paper or about just the difference between these two approaches uh, before we move on? There, these are such treasure troves of data. I mean, uh, Stephen is in, and um, Dr. McDermott are truly to be congratulated, you know, for, for uh, garnering the trust of so many colleagues from around the world to contribute their data to do this analysis. So I will say that, first of all. So as a result of that, their meat and potatoes lend themselves to a lot of questions. <laughs> so we already discussed, you know, the heterogeneity of what um, the term transcranial means. And I think I fully agree. I would love it if you were able to go back and, and think about um, applying a, a second analysis with respect to clinoidectomy and, and optic nerve um, decompression from either approach. Um, the, uh, uh, the other point about outcomes that I have is about the concept of gross total resection and recurrence. Um, in many circles, the term gross total resection you know, triggers controversy when we think about meningioma, specifically because of the, the often significant dural tail and the infiltration of surrounding um, structures by meningioma beyond the nodular disease. Uh, of course, the term Simpson grade also these days sometimes you know, elicits a lot of debate as well. But, but I tend to think that dural tail is still macroscopically visible disease. And that's the, probably the primary reason why some folks favor uh, at least the transcranial look, you know, because it can be difficult to appreciate on MRI. Sometimes I mean, it's a very thin white line, but oftentimes not. Um, that little creep of cells that, that I'm sure you see around the clinoid or planum or so on. 
And um, it seems to me that the issue is not because of the inadequacy of gross total resection for meningioma, but the inappropriate application of the word gross total resection when there's obvious microscopic cells, you know, um, which can be subtle to depreciate on pre-op MRI. So with regards to, um, uh, with regards to like what your observation of patients undergoing extended endoscopic approaches had less recurrence compared to transcranial approaches, three versus 8%. I would um, love to, to hear your thoughts because conceptually this seems to reflect lack of gross total resection in some sense in, in one of these approaches, you know, more so than the biology being different or the tumors growing more in one cohort than the other. What do you think are some of the factors contributing to this finding? I think it's exactly what you are stating. Uh, in the, and first of all, when we talk about recurrence in this, I have to mention the follow-up and the reviewers dogged us on this, but you know, where the, the median follow-up in the study was uh, like about two and a half years, 36 months, 22 months in the endonasal approach. We published a paper, the longer you follow up, the more likely you have recurrent or progressive disease. So with that caveat aside, we're talking about relatively early recurrence for mostly grade one meningioma or progression. Um, why I was really excited about this finding with that caveat is that I think exactly what you're saying, cells hiding, I think they're in the bone, they're in the dura. So if they spread laterally, you're right. You would miss it in those ones that spread laterally, creep over the clinoid. But for the ones that have a concise base and are truly just on the tuberculum, they often have hyperostosis of the bone with cells hidden in the bone. There are cells in the dura. And when you come endonasal, you drill all the bone of the optic canal, you take out the bone of the medial optical carotid recess, you know, decompress the optic nerve. You can cut the dura right down to the carotid artery because you can see it. You, can, you remove all of that dura and just getting to the tumor typically. And so by taking that out, I think you're actually getting a more complete resection of, of the true disease, you might say. Um, coming into nasal, be, just like we, in principle, the Simpson grade, you take all the bone, drill all the bone out till you drill all everything out. You know, we're getting a bit more of that um, coming into nasally. So I do think in general, that's why my suspicion is you get more or, um, lower rates of recurrence, but we definitely need longer follow-up to see if that's just a surprise. But I thought it was interesting because like if you had a near total or subtotal resection, either way, there was no difference, about 20% of rate of recurrence, which is also pretty impressive because I think one of the fallacies in the meningioma world is that, you know, this is a benign tumor, take it out, you're done. And, you know, when we're talking about good resections of tuberculum cell meningiomas with 20% recurrence rate at three years, you know, or progression of a residual, that like it's not so benign. They do need additional treatments, you know, and if it, recurring by your optic nerve, you're going back, you're radiating near the optic nerve, you're doing something. So I think I just highlight that little side bit there. But well, it's so interesting that you mentioned benign, um, because I tend to think, as you know, and, and many of your works have highlighted, that the anterior midline skull base from olfactory to planum to tuberculum, that true midline skull base meningioma, are amongst the most benign of meningiomas. You know, the rates of grade one histopathologic or molecular um, meningioma in that location far exceeds almost anywhere else. And so in your series of so many cases, having a 6.5% of grade two was frankly um, quite high uh, and uh, uh, in my concept of, of this location. Um, and I'm curious, you know, having the benefit of that fraction, do you know if there are any specific clinical or radiographic or other features that can better help us pick out the, the you know, less common grade two atypical meningiomas in this location? We, ha we, I, we have not looked at that. I don't, and I don't have any data aside from the sphericity and other things that we've looked at, you know, is this some bubbly meningioma? Essentially, those are more likely to be grade two. Is there edema in the brain? Um, we didn't see any risk factors for that in this. Um, I, I don't, I would have to look if I don't actually remember if I ran the analysis, maybe I'll have to do it tonight to, you know, do, would there, was edema a predictor of grade two? Um, I think I did and I didn't see that, but um, I can go confirm, but I, I don't really know. And I think 
you say that, you know, you're surprised, but it's 93% of these are grade one. So it is pretty high and your, your gestalt is correct. I mean, most of these are grade one tumors. I think the recurrence rate, it, especially after like a near total resection or something, and the, the difficulty in achieving gross total resection in these is really related to, um, uh, is related to getting all of the tumor. Because even if you get everything you can see, maybe it's in the dura of the optic canal that you didn't resect transcranially. Maybe it's in the bone that you drilled really thin, but you didn't want to just be seeing floppy mucosa down there, you know, and, and getting a CSF leak. You know, where is that tumor hiding? Maybe it's under the optic nerve if you're coming transcranially or just lateral if you're coming endonasally. Even with gross total resection at three years, you know, we had an 8% rate of recurrence transcranially, 3%, you know, endonasally. So you thought you got it all. So I, I think they're also, we, we get tricked a little bit or can't see where those cells are hiding out. Wonderful. I wanted to make sure that I uh, looped in our one of our directors here, Dr. Vega, of course. I know all of our listeners are familiar with, um, uh, and of course works with these pathologies. Dr. Vega, did you have any questions for Dr. McGill or, or Dr. B based off of that discussion? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I was curious about is when you have a recurrence, um, and I know it's a little bit off track from the paper, but, um, you know, do you use the same approach to go back in, you know, or do you find yourself, if you're going endoscopic, then you're coming transcranial afterwards? I'll defer to Linda. <laughs> Well, I think it depends on the recurrence, you know, um, because often recurrences by the time they become radiographically evident are usually at the edges of resection, which in this case is probably more lateral, at least in those recurrent tumors that that for us we followed over the decades are, are often uh, either over a residual clinoid or something more lateral than then compress one more than the other. Um, one the other uh, optic nerve. So at least for me in the salvage setting, the salvage surgery setting, it's with a very specific goal because one eye more asymmetrically than in the original tumor is being affected by the residual tumor lateral to where the prior resection happened. Mm -hmm. And in, in the ones with recurrence that I've seen, I always look, it's not necessary, it's where is the recurrence, just like what Linda said, usually maybe outside of the way they came. But it could also be, I always look at the op note, find out like who did the surgery, call them up, what was going on, you know, and I called them and he's like, oh my goodness, that thing was like glue to the optic nerve. I cut it down with the micro scissors and I was worried the peel vessels were stuck to it. Every time I moved it, the optic nerve moved. Then, then I'm a little less excited to go back and I'm like, hey, maybe we should jump into radiation for this patient, you know, because like understanding why. If it's lateral and you have a great surgeon and it's just like, well, we went endonasal, there probably was a little bit lateral that we missed, then sure, come transcranial, take it out, do, the, do that. But uh, it's very case by case, trying to understand what happened and why there is residual and then where it's at, and then tailor the approach to treat it the best for the patient. Of course, yeah. And do you think grade would make a difference? You know, I mean, I know that, again, with the percentage in your paper, you know, with the 86, I think, or so plus, right? If it was a grade two, would that, you think, change the mind of any of these people? Um, you know, the study is just for discussion. So. Yeah, I, I actually have a patient in my practice who had done exactly that. She had a transcranial operation elsewhere, uh, had a medial residual recurrence. It was grade two. Um, she didn't want to do anything about it, didn't want to do radiation, kept growing fast, vision kept getting worse. So she, she ended up having an endonasal approach. I uh, had it done with another surgeon. She was one of these people who sees a lot of surgeons, but I follow her locally here. And they went into nasal and they had another subtotal resection because of the, this tumor was just completely glued and adherent. And so finally she went forward with radiation. But I do think um, uh, exactly this thing can happen. And if it is a grade two, you know, we, we, if it's a convexity meningioma, there's a little more room to gamble, but I would be more, much more pro-adjuvant radiotherapy if it's a grade two, because 
it's hard. And I can't say that with Linda and, and Al Mefti and her other ear, but you know, we don't have a lot for these tumors and there's not a lot of room for growth when your recurrence is right next to the optic nerve and this tumor is going to start compressing it. And again, if you do a good decompression on the way in, your optic nerve is decompressed. There's good data on the safety of either radio surgery or fractionated radiation uh, around the optic nerve, if, depending on the right, you know, the tumor features. But um, I think being smart and doing adjuvant radiotherapy is probably the best course of action. Yeah. Well, here with Stephen, it really depends on what was done. Is it a failure of prior therapy or is it a failure of the biology of the tumor? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to make sure that we have time here to talk about this, uh, the McGill-McDermott scale. I'm going to put that here on the screen so that we can see this wonderful figure, figure that you added to uh, your paper. Would you mind just explaining for us what the McGill-McDermott scale is, um, why you felt the need to, to have a classification scale like this, what it predicts, um, and sort of generally what the different uh, classifications are? Yeah, so our goal in doing the whole study was to really collaborate amongst all of us as a neurosurgical community to say what features can guide us in predicting outcomes so we can inform our patients better, we can choose the best approach for that patient. And when we when we sat down, and this was really Mike McDermott's brainchild, Dr. McDermott, he looked at uh, tumors and said, you know, when do I have trouble? When is it hard? Well, when they're bigger than the width of the optic canal. So which in the anatomic average, if you look across the average distance of the interoptic distance is 17 millimeters. So that's how we came up with, uh, he came up with that diameter. Next, if there's optic canal invasion, your risk goes up. You got to decompress that nerve. You've got to open the canal, get the tumor out. Um, initially we had thought, you know, uh, if it extends into one canal and then if it extends into two canals, does that make a difference? With this study, we were able to say if there's invasion in the optic canal, then that affects your likelihood of getting a gross total resection. If you and then where else do you get into trouble? Well, when the vasculature is encased, you know, if the tumor is stuck and in invading the vasculature or encased to it, uh, that adds another degree of complexity. And you can be very slick endoscopically, but I you know, a good microsurgeon, you know, microsurgical resection with a microscope approach, you have more degrees of freedom. If you have a wide approach, uh, you have better dexterity. You're not nine centimeters away from your instrument. Uh, maybe you are, but your, your handle is, it, it fits in the hand. I just, I think there's a little bit better ability to dissect free from the vasculature. And so that's what we had thought. And we found out it really only matters if the tumor truly encases a vessel. Otherwise, and and most of these endoscopically, you bring them down and the, the arachnoid sheath is very well preserved uh, in this location. You can just roll the vessels out of it. But there are times where it gets adherent and the more in case they are, the more likely I think that is to be the case. And then if you're coming from the bottom, peeling it down, you can get into real trouble. And that's where all the, the graveyard stories of Henry Marsh and stuff that these surgeons walk around with of having a PCOM rupture or having a, a ACOM rupture, like some issue where you get into a real vascular event or blindness from a, you know, a adherent superior hypothesis, something like that. So those were the factors. We simplified it from our 2018 paper down to this scale that's shown here with a tumor score of greater than 17 millimeters gets you to a score of two versus one. Optic canal invasion gets you another point. And then if the arteries are encased uh, more than 180 degrees, you get another point. And by developing that scale, you could then go and have, we developed, no, we created nomograms. So you could take your total score and just say, what is the likelihood of visual worsening? So if you have a score of six, and this is figure four in the propensity match paper, if you have a total refined score of six, so a big tumor invading the optic canals, encasing the vessels, you actually have a almost 16% chance of visual decline after the case. And this is really helpful when you're trying to tell patients about the risk of their operation, because you can just say, oh, we have 10% risk of, you can just say 10% risk of visual decline, but that's not really true. And we all know that like a tumor that's small in between the optic nerves, whether you come endonasal or transcranial, that risk is very low with no preoperative deficit. But uh, this really helps us be able to inform the patients. And so then you can punch in the scale and say, hey, your risk of visual worsening with your big, terrible tumor is actually 15, 16%. Um, we also can use it to predict your extent of resection. 
So if you have, you know, take the total score, you add in whether or not they have a visual deficit, whether or not they have edema, uh, the more edema you have, the more visual deficit you have, and the total refined score being higher, you're less likely. So if you have a big tumor with edema and a visual deficit, your likelihood of a gross total resection is about 55% in our study, or 50 to 55%. Very different than if I'm going to get a subtotal resection, do I want to take a 17% risk of CSF leak? for my patient that's gonna put them in the hospital with a second surgery and a lumbar drain for five days? Or do I wanna do a cranial orbital, mini craniotomy, something like that, super orbital eyebrow, if you're, if you're uh, Dan Kelly, whatever your choice of approach is to just go subfrontal and be done with this in uh, you know a morning and an early afternoon as opposed to all day through the nose and taking that risk. So I think that you know, even I think that's really what I wanted people to come away with from this study and why we set out to do it. So you can then take those things and have a, a, a chat with the patient and say, hey, you do have a pre-op visual deficit. So if I go endonasal and I've had this exact conversation just two, a week and a, or two a month ago with a patient, I said, our paper shows if we go endonasal, you have a little bit better chance of visual improvement, but your tumor is lateral to the optic nerve. Uh, it invades the optic canal. The likelihood that I get a gross total resection is much lower. Um, the risk of CSF leak, and we showed that in the first paper, is 17% across the years since 2006 when Corral and uh, Haddad published the nasoceptal flap, which made this really a viable approach. You know, in the last 18 years, that risk is stubborn, somewhere between 10 and 20%. And these are the best surgeons reporting their actual data. You know, so. That's a, that's a, I tell the patients, you got a one in five, one in 10 chance that you're going to need another surgery or a lumbar drain or something like that to, in five days of misery in the hospital. So for her, I can also say, you know, if we went endonasal and it's a little tumor and I can get a gross total resection, you're most likely not going to have to have that tumor come back. So let's take that risk. That's really worth it. We have a high likelihood of gross total resection. We, your vision is likely you're to get better. But if it's a, a six tumor, if it's extending laterally, um, now you don't get that benefit of decreased recurrence going into nasal. And so is it really worth that to the patient? Um, and that's really, I think, to me, the meat of the study of what I wanted to do and when I how I apply this in my practice and why we created the McGill-McDermott scale is really to try to give somebody where you can look at the scan and then say, okay, your score is six or your score is three. We can take this out through the nose. You're probably gonna, you have a better chance that your vision gets better. Um, you don't need to have a craniotomy and we can do that. And so that's probably gonna maybe be a great choice for you. It also comes down to patient specific factors because even the visual improvement, like if you look in the propensity match samples, the increased likelihood of getting better goes from, I don't remember the exact number, like 58% to 76%, right? It's a 10% more likelihood, 15% more likelihood that your vision is going to get better with one approach. Reality is 50 to 65% of patients are going to have an improvement in their vision. So I think doing what's best in your hands, what the patient wants, and I think as a, someone who's endoscopic trained and, you know, I love doing these through the nose. I also don't disregard the sinonasal morbidity of an extended endonasal approach. And I think you can do a lot to prevent that, but, um, you know, people, it's amazing. You have very few complaints about people who have a bicoronal incision or something like that, like they heal really well, or an incision behind the hairline that they never see and they breathe normally. So it, it's very patient specific and surgeon specific. You know, some people have beautiful eyebrow outcomes, others, you know, it's a, a more difficult cosmetic risk, you know, so you, it's very much a joint decision-making. And I think this grading scale coupled with the outcomes and the nomograms really give a tool to the surgeon to say, hey, these are, it helps set expectations and then helps you understand why for the tumors you asked earlier about that have equipose, where you don't have that lateral extension, where you know you're going to be less likely to get a complete resection. Thank you for that answer. Um, before we move on, I know we're running short on time here. Dr. B, did you have any questions about the sort of the nomogram there or anything else that Dr. McGill mentioned there? I just want to congratulate Stephen for, for a really incredible work on so many levels. I mean, it was authentic, thoughtful, well-designed, and but I think there's actually a lot more that we can learn from this cohort. And I looked for, uh, forward to your 
phase two analysis of another five-year follow-up. Yeah, and as a little plug, my, Dr. McDermott is trying to do this prospectively. The final weakness of the study, you know, we just did better, worse, the same. And we need to be more quantitative in our visual outcomes because visual worsening, that's a tiny bit of blurriness on a Humphrey visual field test that doesn't affect you is visual worsening, but it is not being blind. And, you know, a good surgery may actually, that's just fine. You know, so really quantifying the visual extent, I think, as we document and take care of our patients so we can understand our experience throughout our careers, it's really important to do that meticulously and use objective visual field analysis. Thank you. One more question for you since we're running short on time here, Dr. McGill. Um, what is a take home message that you would uh, give, whether it's residents in training, listening to this podcast or those you know, several years in the practice that are treating these tumors? What from your data would you say is a, is a good take home message from this discussion? and your data? Um, I think the take home message, number one, do the right thing for the patient in your hands. Number two, if it's a tumor that's amenable to gross total resection, taking it out through the nose it early likely has a better chance that their vision will improve and your, the tumor is less likely to come back. So if, it, if it's something that in your hands you can take out safely through the nose and reconstruct, um, you know, I think that that does lead to better outcomes, which was a surprise. We actually went into it with the bias that, you know, you'd see better outcomes transcranially or no better endonasally. And, you know, and then counseling patients, this is a nuanced uh, decision that takes into those consideration, those factors and the very real morbidity of a CSF leak. It won't, it shouldn't kill you unless you get meningitis, but um it is a lot for a patient to go through and you want to help them through this chapter of their lives. And I think, you know, taking all that into consideration, you then can help the patient uh, get through this challenge for them. And hopefully bring back their vision, which is one of the great joys of doing these surgeries. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I want to thank all of our, uh, our guest faculty, Dr. B. Thank you so much for joining us as well, of course, as our uh, author, Dr. McGill. Uh, and of course, our director uh, that joined us today, Dr. Uh, Rafael Vega. Um, and of course, thank you all for listening to the CNS Journal Club podcast. Uh, I do want to remind everyone that this podcast activity is available to claim for 1.5 CME and is complimentary to all CNS members through the online education catalog. Thank you again for tuning in, and we hope that you will join us for the next episode of the Journal Club podcast. Thank you so Thanks much. Thanks for having us. See you, Jeff.